Oh, hello there. Welcome back to our People's Historian. I'm Jason Kishinev, and we are just finishing up chap Chapter 16, talking about the Cold War. Uh, Truman's executive order on loyalty in 1947 required the Department of Justice to draw up a list of organizations it decided were totalitarian, fascist, communist, or subversive, <clears throat> or as seeking to alter the form of government of the United States by unconstitutional means. Not only membership in, but also sympathetic association with any organization on the Attorney General's list would be considered in determining disloyalty. In 1954, there were hundreds of groups on this list, including, besides the Communist Party and the Ku Klux Klan, the Chopin Cultural Center, the Cervantes Fraternal Society, the Committee for the Negro in the Arts, the Committee for the Protection of the Bill of Rights, the League of American Writers, the, Natural the Nature Friends of America, People's Drama, the Washington Bookshop Association, and the Yugoslav Seamen's Club. It was not McCarthy and the Republicans, but the liberal Democrat Truman administration whose Justice Department initiated a series of prosecutions that intensified the nation's anti-communist mood. The most important of these was the prosecution of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg in the summer of 1950. The Rosenbergs were charged with espionage. The major evidence was supplied by a few people who had already confessed to being spies and were either in prison or under indictment. David Greenglass, the brother of Ethel Rosenberg, was the key witness. He had been a machinist at the Manhattan Project Library at Los Alamos, New Mexico in 1944 and 1945 when the atomic bomb was being made there and testified that Julius Rosenberg had asked him to get information for the Russians. Greenglass said he had made sketches from memory for his brother-in-law of experiments with lenses to be used to detonate atomic bombs. He said Rosenberg had given him half of the cardboard top to a box of jello and told him a man would show up in New Mexico with the other half and that in June 1945, Harry Gold appeared with the other half of the box top, and Greenglass gave him information he had memorized. Gold, already serving a 30-year sentence in another espionage case, came out of jail to corroborate Greenglass's testimony. He had never met the Rosenbergs, but said a Soviet an embassy official gave him half of a jello box top and told him to contact Greenglass, saying, I come from Julius. Gold said he took the sketches Greenglass had drawn from memory and gave them to the Russian official. There were troubling aspects to all of this. Did Gold cooperate in return for early release from prison? After serving 15 years of his 30-year sentence, he was paroled. Did Greenglass, under indictment at the time he testified, also know that his life depended on his cooperation? He was given 15 years served half of it and was released. How reliable a memorizer of atomic information was David Greenglass, an, er an ordinary level machinist, not a scientist, who had taken six courses at Brooklyn Polytechnical Institute and flunked five of them. Gold's and Greenglass's stories had first not been in accord, but they were both placed on the same floor of the Tombs Prison in New York before the trial giving them a chance to coordinate their testimony. How reliable was Gold's testimony? It turned out that he had been prepared for the Rosenberg case by 400 hours of interviews with the FBI. It also turned out that Gold was a frequent and highly imaginative liar. He was a witness... <laughs> Meow. He was, he was a witness in a later trial where defense counsel asked Gold about his invention of a fictional wife and fictional children. The attorney asked, You lied for a period of six years? Gold responded, I lied for a period of 16 years, not alone six years. Gold was the only witness at the trial to connect Julius Rosenberg and David Greenglass to the Russians. <laughs> the FBI agent, 
who had questioned Gold, was interviewed 20 years after the case by a journalist. He was asked about the password Gold was supposed to have used. Julius sent me, the FBI man said. Gold couldn't remember the name he had been given. He thought he had said, I come from, or something like that. I suggested, might it have been Julius? That refreshed his memory. When the Rosenbergs were found guilty, and Judge Irving Kaufman pronounced sentence, he said, I believe your conduct in putting into the hands of the Russians the A-bomb years before our best scientists predicted Russia would perfect the bomb has already caused the communist aggression in Korea with the resultant casualties exceeding 50,000 Americans and who knows but that many millions more of innocent people may pay the price for your treason. He sentenced them both to die in the electric chair. Morton Sobel was also on trial as a co-conspirator with the Rosenbergs. The chief witness against him was an old friend, the best man at his wedding, a man who was facing possible perjury charges by the federal government for lying about his political past. This was Max Elitcher, who testified that he had once driven Sobel to a Manhattan housing project where the Rosenbergs lived and that Sobel got out of the car took from the glove compartment what, what appeared to be a film can, went off, and then returned without the can. There was no evidence about what was in the film can. The case against Sobel seemed so weak that Sobel's lawyer decided there was no need to present a defense. But the jury found Sobel guilty, and Kaufman sentenced him to 30 years in prison. He was sent to Alcatraz. Parole was repeatedly denied, and he spent 19 years in various prisons before he was released. FBI documents subpoenaed in the 1970s showed that Judge Kaufman had conferred with the prosecutors secretly about the sentences he would give in the case. Another document shows that after three years of appeal, a meeting took place between Attorney General Herbert Brownell and Chief Justice Fred Vinson of the Supreme Court, and the Chief Justice assured the Attorney General that if any Supreme Court Justice gave a stay of execution, he would immediately call a full court session and override it. There had been a worldwide campaign of protest. Albert Einstein, whose letter to Roosevelt early in the war had initiated work on the atomic bomb, appealed for the Rosenbergs, as did Jean-Paul Sartre, Pablo Picasso, and the sister of Bartolomeo Vanzetti. There was an appeal to President Truman just before he left office in the spring of 1953. It was turned down. Then another appeal to the new president, Dwight Eisenhower, who also turned it down. At the last moment, just Justice William O. Douglas granted a stay of ex execution. Chief Justice Vincent sent out special jets to bring the vacationing justices back to Washington from various parts of the country. They canceled Douglas's stay in time for the Rosenbergs to be executed June 19, 1953. It was a demonstration to the people of the country, though very few could identify with the Rosenbergs, of what lay at the end of the line for those the government decided were traitors. In that same period of the early 50s, the House Un-American Activities Committee was at its heyday, interrogating Americans about their communist connections, holding them in contempt if they refused to answer, distributing millions of pamphlets to the American public. 100 Things You Should Know About Communism. Where Can Communists Be Found? Everywhere. Liberals often criticized the committee, but in Congress, liberals and conservatives alike voted to fund it year after year. By 1958, only one member of the House of Representatives, James Roosevelt, voted against giving it money. Although Truman criticized the committee, his own attorney general had expressed in 1950 the same idea that motivated its investigations. There are today many communists in America. They are everywhere, in factories, offices, butcher shops, on street corners, in private business, and each carries in himself the germs of death for society. Liberal intellectuals rode the anti-communist bandwagon. 
Commentary magazine denounced the Rosenbergs and their supporters. One of Commentary's writers, Irving Crystal, asked in March 1952, do we defend our rights by protecting communists? His answer, no. It was Truman's Justice Department that prosecuted the leaders of the Communist Party under the Smith Act, charging them with conspiring to teach and advocate the overthrow of a government by force and violence. The evidence consisted mostly of the fact that the communists were distributing Marxist-Leninist literature, which the prosecution contended called for violent revolution. There was certainly not evidence of any immediate danger of violent revolution by the Communist Party. The Supreme Court decision was given by Truman's appointee, Chief Justice Vinson. He stretched the old doctrine of the clear and present danger by saying there was a clear and present conspiracy to make a revolution at some convenient time. And so, the top leadership of the Communist Party was put in prison, and soon after, most of its organizers went underground. <clears throat> Undoubtedly, there was success in the attempt to make the general public fearful of communists and ready to take drastic actions against them. Imprisonment at home, military action abroad, the whole culture was permeated with anti-communism. The large circulation magazines had articles like How Communists Get That Way and Communists Are After Your Child. <laughs> the New York Times in 1956 ran an editorial We would not knowingly employ a Communist Party member in the news or editorial department because we would not trust his ability to report the news objectively or to comment on it honestly. An FBI informer's story about his exploits as a communist who became an FBI agent, I Led Three Lives, was serialized in 500 newspapers and put on television. Hollywood movies had titles like, I Married a Communist, and I Was a Communist for the FBI. Between 1948 and 1954, more than 40 anti-communist films came out of Hollywood. Even the American Civil Liberties Union, set up specifically to defend the liberties of communists and all other political groups, began to wilt in the Cold War atmosphere. It had already started in this direction back in 1940, when it expelled one of its charter members, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, because she was a member of the Communist Party. In the 50s, the ACLU was hesitant to defend Corliss Lamont, its own board member, and Owen Latimer, who both were under attack. It was reluctant to defend publicly the communist leaders during the first Smith Act trial and kept completely out of the Rosenberg case, saying no civil liberty issues were involved. Young and old were taught that anti-communism was heroic. Three million copies were sold of the book by Mickey Spillane, published in 1951, One Lonely Night, in which the hero, Mike Hammer, says, I killed more people tonight than I have fingers on my hands. I shot them in cold blood and enjoyed every minute of it. They were commies, red sons of bitches who should have died long ago. A comic strip hero, Captain America, said, Beware, commies, spies, traitors, and foreign agents. Captain America, with all loyal free men behind him, is looking for you. And in the 50s, school children all over the country participated in air raid drills in which a Soviet attack on America was signaled by sirens. The children had to crouch under their desks until it was all clear. It was an atmosphere in which the government could get mass support for a policy of rearmament. The system, so shaken in the 30s, had learned that war production could bring stability and high profits. Truman's anti-communism was attractive. The business publication Steel had said in 1946 November, even before the Truman Doctrine, that Truman's policies gave the firm assurance that maintaining and building our preparations for war will be big business in the United States for at least a considerable period ahead. That prediction turned out to be accurate. At the start of 1950, the total U.S. budget was about $40 billion, and the military part of it was about $12 billion. 
But in 1955, five years later, the military part alone was $40 billion out of a total of $62 billion. A small but courageous movement against the military buildup led by the War Registers League and other groups, failed to stop it. In 1960, the military budget was $45.8 billion, 49.7% of the budget. That year, John F. Kennedy was elected president, and he immediately moved to increase military spending. In 14 months, the Kennedy administration added $9 billion to defense funds, according to Edgar Batome. By 1962, based on a series of invented scares about Soviet military buildups, a false bomber gap and a false missile gap, the United States had overwhelming nuclear superiority. It had the equivalent in nuclear weapons of 1,500 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs, far more than enough to destroy every major city in the world. The equivalent, in fact, of 10 tons of TNT for every man, woman, and child on Earth. 10 tons of TNT for every man, woman, and child on Earth. To deliver these bombs, the United States had more than 50 intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles, 80 missiles on nuclear submarines, 90 missiles on stations overseas, 1,700 bombers capable of reaching the Soviet Union, 300 fighter bombers on aircraft carriers able to carry atomic weapons and 1,000 land-based supersonic fighters able to carry atomic bombs. The Soviet Union was obviously behind. It had between 50 and 100 intercontinental ballistic missiles and fewer than 200 long-range bombers, but the U.S. budget kept mounting. The hysteria kept growing. The profits of corporations getting defense contracts multiplied and employment and wages moved ahead just enough to keep, keep a substantial number of Americans dependent on war industries for their living. By 1970 the US military budget was 80 billion dollars and the corporations involved in military production were making fortunes. Two-thirds of the 40 billion dollars spent on weapon systems was going to 12 or 15 giant industrial corporations whose main reason for existence was to fulfill government military contracts. Senator Paul Douglas, an economist and chairman of the Joint Economic Committee of the Senate, noted that six-sevenths of these contracts are not competitive. In the alleged interest of secrecy, the government picks a company and draws up a contract in more or less secret negotiations. C. Wright Mills, in his book on the, of the 50s, The Power Elite, counted the military as part of the top elite, along with politicians and corporations. These elements were more and more intertwined. A Senate report showed that the 100 largest defense contractors, who held 67.4% of the military contracts, employed more than 2,000 former high-ranking officers of the military. Meanwhile, the United States, giving economic aid to certain countries, was creating a network of American corporate control over the globe and building its political influence over the countries it aided. The Marshall Plan of 1948, which gave $16 billion in economic aid to Western European countries in four years, had an economic aim to build up markets for American exports. George Marshall... A general, then Secretary of State, was quoted in an early 1948 State Department bulletin. It is idle to think that a Europe left to its own efforts would remain open to American business in the same way that we have known it in the past. <clears throat> the Marshall Plan also had a political motive. The Communist parties of Italy and France were strong, and the United States decided to use pressure and money to keep communists out of the cabinets of those countries. When the plan was beginning, Truman's Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, said, These measures of relief and reconstruction have been only in part suggested by humanitarianism. Your Congress has authorized and your government is carrying out 
a policy of relief and reconstruction today chiefly as a matter of national self-interest. From 1952 on, foreign aid was more and more obviously designed to build up military power in non-communist countries. In the next 10 years, of the $50 billion in aid granted by the United States to 90 countries, only $5 billion was for non-military economic development. When John F. Kennedy took office, he launched the Alliance for Progress, a program of help for Latin America, emphasizing social reform to better the lives of people, but it turned out to be mostly military aid to keep in power right-wing dictatorships and enable them to stave off revolutions. From military aid, it was a short step to military intervention. What Truman had said at the start of the Korean War about the rule of force and the rule of law was again and again, under Truman and his successors, contradicted by American action. In Iran in 1953, the Central Intelligence Agency succeeded in overthrowing a government which nationalized the oil industry. In Guatemala in 1954, a legally elected government was overthrown by an invasion force of mercenaries trained by the CIA at military bases in Honduras and Nicaragua and supported by four American fighter planes flown by American pilots. The invasion put into power Colonel Carlos Castillo Armas, who had at one time received military training at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. The government that the United States overthrew was the most democratic Guatemala had ever had. The president, Jacobo Arbenz, was a left-of-center socialist. Four of the 56 seats in the Congress were held by communists. What was most unsettling to American business interests was that Arbenz had expropriated 234,000 acres of land owned by the United Fruit Company, offering compensation that United Fruit called unacceptable. Armas, in power, gave the land back to United Fruit, abolished the tax on interest and dividends to foreign investors, eliminated the secret ballot, and jailed thousands of political critics. In 1958, the Eisenhower government sent thousands of Marines to Lebanon to make sure the pro-American government there was not toppled by a revolution and to keep an armed presence in that oil-rich area. The Democrat-Republican, liberal conservative agreement to prevent or overthrow revolutionary governments whenever possible, whether communist, socialist, or anti-United fruit, became most evident in 1961 in Cuba. That little island, 90 miles from Florida, had gone through a revolution in 1959 by a rebel, rebel force led by Fidel Castro, in which the American-backed dictator, Fulgencio Batista, was overthrown. The revolution was a direct threat to American business interests. Franklin D. Roosevelt's good neighbor policy had repealed the Platt Amendment, which permitted American intervention in Cuba, but the United States still kept a naval base at Guantanamo, and U.S. business interests still dominated the Cuban economy. American companies controlled 80 to 100 percent of Cuba's utilities, mines, cattle ranches, and oil refineries, 40 percent of the sugar industry, and 50 percent of the public railways. Fidel Castro had spent time in prison after he led an unsuccessful attack in 1953 on an army barracks in Santiago. Out of prison, he went to Mexico, met Argentine revolutionary Che Guevara, and returned in 1956 to Cuba. His tiny force fought guerrilla warfare from the jungles and mountains against Batista's army, drawing more and more popular support. Then came out of the mountains and marched across the country to Havana. The Batista government fell apart on New Year's Day, 1959. In power, Castro moved to set up a nationwide system of education, of housing, of land distribution to landless peasants. The government confiscated over a million acres of land from three American companies, including the United Fruit Company. Cuba needed money to finance its pro programs and the United States was not eager to lend it. The International Monetary Fund, 
dominated by the United States, would not loan money to Cuba either because Cuba would not accept its stabilization conditions, which seemed to undermine the revolutionary program that had begun there. When Cuba now signed a trade agreement with the Soviet Union, American-owned oil companies in Cuba refused to refine crude oil that came from the Soviet Union. Castro seized these companies. The United States cut down on its sugar buying from Cuba, on which Cuba's economy depended, and the Soviet Union immediately agreed, agreed to buy all the 700,000 tons of sugar that the United States would not buy. Cuba had changed. The good neighbor policy did not apply. In the spring of 1960, President Eisenhower secretly authorized the Central Intelligence Agency to arm and train anti-Castro Cuban exiles in Guatemala for a future invasion of Cuba. When Kennedy took office in the spring of 1961, the CIA had 1,400 exiles armed and trained he moved ahead with the plans, and on April 17, 1961, the CIA trained force, with some Americans participating, landed at the Bay of Pigs on the south shore of Cuba, 90 miles from Havana. They expected to stimulate a general uprising against Castro, but it was a popular regime. There was no uprising. In three days, the CIA forces were crushed by Castro's army. The whole Bay of Pigs affair was accompanied by hypocrisy and lying. The invasion was a violation, recalling Truman's rule of law of a treaty the U.S. had signed, the Charter of the Organization of American States, which reads, No state or group of states that has the right to intervene, directly or indirectly, for any reason whatever in the internal or external affairs of any other state. <clears throat> Four days before the invasion, because there had been press reports of secret bases and CIA training for invaders, President Kennedy told the press conference, there will not be, under any conditions, any intervention in Cuba by United States Armed Forces. Again, I apologize for the bad JFK impression. True, the landing force was Cuban, but it was all organized by the United States, and American warplanes, including American pilots, were involved. Kennedy had approved the use of unmarked Navy jets in the invasion. Four American pilots of those planes were killed, and their families were not told the truth about how those men died. The success of the liberal, liberal conservative coalition in creating a national anti-communist consensus was shown by how certain important news publications cooperated with the Kennedy administration in deceiving the American public on the Cuban invasion. The New Republic was about to print an article on the CIA training of Cuban exiles a few weeks before the invasion. Historian Arthur Schlesinger was given copies of the article in advance. He showed them to Kennedy, who asked that the article not be printed. The New Republic went along. James Reston and Turner Catledge of the New York Times, on the government's request, did not run a story about the imminent invasion. Arthur Schlesinger said of the New York Times action, This was another patriotic act, but in retrospect I have wondered whether if the press had behaved irresponsibly it would not have spared the country a disaster. What seemed to bother him and other liberals in the Cold War consensus was not that the United States was interfering in the revolutionary movements of other countries but that it was doing so unsuccessfully. Around 1960, the 15-year effort since the end of World War II to break up the communist radical upsurge of the New Deal and wartime years seemed successful. The Communist Party was in disarray, its leaders in jail, its membership shrunken, its influence in the trade union movement very small. The trade union movement itself had become more controlled, more conservative. The military budget was taking half of the national budget, but the public was accepting this. The radiation from the testing of nuclear weapons had dangerous possibilities for human health, but the public was not aware of that. The Atomic Energy Commission insisted that the deadly effects of atomic tests were exaggerated, 
and an, an article in 1955 in the Reader's Digest, the largest circulation magazine in the United States, said, the scare stories about this country's atomic tests are simply not justified. In the mid-50s, there was a flurry of enthusiasm for air raid shelters. The public was being told these would keep them safe from atomic blasts. A government consultant and scientist, Herman Kahn, wrote a book on thermonuclear war, in which he explained that it was possible to have a nuclear war without total destruction of the world. The people should not be so frightened of it. A political scientist named Henry Kissinger wrote a book published in 1957 in which he said, with proper tactics, nuclear war need not be as destructive as it appears. The country was on a permanent war economy which had big pockets of poverty, but there were enough people at work making enough money to keep things quiet. The distribution of wealth was still unequal. From 1944 to 1961, it had not changed much. The lowest fifth of the families received 5% of all the income. The highest fifth received 45% of all the income. In 1953, 1 1.6% of the adult population owned more than 80% of the corporate stock and nearly 90% of the corporate bonds. About 200 giant corporations out of 200,000 corporations, one-tenth of 1% 1 of all corporations controlled about 60% of the manufacturing wealth of the entire nation. When John F. Kennedy presented his budget to the nation after his first year in office, it was clear that, liberal Democrat or not, there would be no major change in the distribution of income or wealth or tax advantages. New York Times columnist James Reston summed up Kennedy's budget messages as avoiding any sudden transformation of the home front, as well as a more ambitious frontal attack on the unemployment problem. Reston said he agreed to a tax break for business investments in plant expansion and modernization. He is not spoiling for a fight with the Southern Conservatives over civil rights. He has been urging the unions to keep wage demands down so that prices can be competitive in the world markets and jobs increased. And he has been trying to reassure the business community that he does not want any Cold War with them on the home front. This week in his news conference, he refused to carry out his promise to bar discrimination in government-insured housing, but talked instead about postponing this until there was a national consensus in its favor. During these 12 months, the president has moved over into the decisive middle ground of American politics. On this middle ground, all seemed secure. Nothing had to be done for blacks. Nothing had to be done to change the economic structure. An aggressive foreign policy could continue. The country seemed under control. And then in the 1960s came a series of explosive rebellions in every area of American life, which showed that all the system's estimates of security and success were wrong. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the reading. I hope you'll tune into the next episode where we'll begin chapter 17. And please remember to hit that like and subscribe button and make sure to hit that notification bell because YouTube is known to unsubscribe viewers. Thank you very much and we'll see you next time.